The world has its eyes on our nation's capital as Ottawa has been taken over by those who are frustrated by government mandates. Thousands are part of the Freedom Convoy continue to demonstrate in Ottawa. Ottawa's Mayor Jim Watson has declared a state of emergency and the protesters say they're not leaving until all of the COVID-19 mandates are lifted. They're also hoping that Justin Trudeau will resign as Prime Minister. Now, there are other convoys going on in other parts of the world, including in the United States, supporting their brothers and sisters in Ottawa. And that's where one of our regular contributors, Lisa Daftari, joins us from. Lisa's in Los Angeles. Lisa, a large contingent of American truckers are forming convoys, showing their support for their Canadian cousins. Yes, I mean, this is the tangible support, right? Obviously, truckers being in the same industry, they are saying enough is enough. But think about all the other people who are virtually supporting these truckers, whether it's going to one of these websites that are uh, collecting money and donations or just verbally supporting them, whether it's on Facebook or Twitter or any of the other social media platforms. These truckers have a tremendous amount of support. There's so many people who are saying, we are truckers, meaning we feel what you're feeling uh, enough Enough is enough. And regardless of where you live, uh, what you do for a living, how you're being affected, whether you have children in school, whether it's your industry or your place of, of work that is demanding that you get vaccinated or demanding that you wear a mask or demanding something of you that is taking away your freedom, you're saying enough is enough. And that is why there are so many people that are united with these very brave, very courageous, very determined truckers. And um, to see American truckers in the same industry, you know, trying to follow in their footsteps and saying, we, we drive alone. I mean, forget it. We're, and, I, and I love this image. We have it on our website this morning, um, along with a story about the, the convoy. But the, the photo is saying um, there's a truck with a, a picture on it that says we are not against vaccines. We are against vaccine mandates. And that is the point that they want to drive home, because that is the point that that the um, opponents are using to discredit or to dismiss this movement. There are many ways in which they're trying to dismiss this movement, whether they're trying to say it's being violent, whether they're saying it's a State of emergency, whether they're saying that they are being vandals, uh, whether they're saying they are elements that are um, quite nefarious inside of the, the convoy, whether they're swastikas or other uh, signs. And, and again, these are stragglers. These are, are, are on the margins. We won't allow them to detract from the main point. And that's what these truckers are saying. This is our movement. We're not allowing them to hijack it. And again, this is a movement for freedom. And because of that, overarching theme. They have so many supporters in all corners of the world on this one. Lisa, what can you tell us about the uh, investigation into GoFundMe? As you know, the Freedom Convoy had around $10 million in the GoFundMe account. And then GoFundMe says, no, we're going to not give any of the money to the truckers for food, lodgings and fuel. Instead, we're going to disperse it to charities. But then all of a sudden, because of pressure, they, they decided to refund everyone who donated to the actual cause, but now there's an investigation as to what's really been going on with GoFundMe. What can you tell us? Yeah, you know what they did to themselves is, is um, they're gonna be hurting on this one, Hal. Imagine you give $10 to a charity of your choice and then you're told, we don't like the charity of your choice. We're going to give it to the charity of our choice. Well, we're not here to give money to GoFundMe. We're here to give the charity to where we want it to be directed, where our funds, our money, our emotions, and our passion is directed. And because of this, because of the investigations, now, Hal, remember what GoFundMe has, has, has sought out to do. Imagine if there wasn't this pressure of investigation. Imagine if there wasn't this, we're going to look into it and we're going to figure out what they've been doing. Because remember, they've been giving and, and trying to raise money for some very, very shady causes, very, very skeptical uh, situations there that they're going to be looking into. Now, look, people gave that money fair and square. People gave that money because they wanted to support. And as I said, there's tremendous support for freedom and for this movement. So people came out, they gave all of this money and they wanted to shut down their page. At one point in the beginning, if you remember, they said, we're going to shut down the page until we hear where this money is going. What, since when did GoFundMe request that of any of the other charities that they raised money for? And there are some, again, very questionable causes that have used GoFundMe. Uh, and, and the money has been you know, um, embezzled in ways that there are, are, you can Google this. You don't have to hear it from me. But the point being, people are upset. GoFundMe kept 
pivoting on its position, whether it's to shut down the page, whether it's to demand more information from the truckers convoy as to how this money was going to be spent, whether it was to allocate money, give them an allowance, a portion, a percentage of the funds each each day uh, to now giving the money back to people who gave it. And people have to find a different way, which they have. They have found a different platform on which only $2 million has been raised. But the bottom line is this, Hal. They're trying to silence people. They're trying to stop people from giving money. They're trying to stop people physically from going out and protesting. And this is not the freedom that we're used to, especially here in the West. And again, kudos to these truckers and their supporters for not backing down under any of this pressure, under any of these obstacles and challenges. But um, we will continue to support them from the silence, continue to report on their cause, not because we're biased, but because we are pro-freedom. And if they take away their freedom, they can take away our freedom, and we won't even be able to have this conversation. So for that reason, we want to have a very clear um, line of communication, and we want to keep their story going. Lisa, the White House says that Russia could attack Ukraine at any moment, but diplomacy is still apparently on the table. Now, there are reports surfacing that Russian President Vladimir Putin could annex Ukraine's Donbass region. Tell me more about that. Sure, and we've known that from, from day one, right? We knew that Russia's um, ambitions and their goals for the region and, and in total are very clear. I mean, that what's missing here is what is the West's goal in, in this equation? That's what's missing from this, this picture. We know that Putin is a statesman. He's out to build his country and the Russian empire and the image of his power and the, the actual territory size. He, we know that he inserts himself in almost all foreign policy issues. Um, and now we see that you know, all options are on the table. What's funny is that the White House decided a few days ago that they were going to walk back from using the phrase that the, the, the threat from Russia into Ukraine is imminent. They didn't want to give off this urgency or this, this, uh, this picture of this, this emergency where that it's going to happen anytime soon, and they didn't want people to worry about it. What they did want to do is to say that, again, all options are on the table. They talked about sanctions. Again, those sanctions have been debated back and forth, whether to put sanctions on Russia before they go into Ukraine which would leave us in a situation for Russia to say, well, I, if I do, I'm damned. If I don't, I'm damned. So why don't I just go ahead and go for it? I'm being sanctioned anyway. Um, so it's a very, very difficult equation. But I think the most important thing here is to know that Russia has not backed down. They are very serious and the threat is still imminent, um, even though the White House may not want to use those words. And, you know, U.S. officials say Russia has assembled 70 percent of its military needed to launch this massive invasion of Ukraine that could result at least in tens of thousands of deaths. Could we see a world war here? Because will Russia even stop at Ukraine? Maybe they'll go after Belarus, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan and so forth and try and reassemble the USSR. Sure. I mean, look, the, all of these are, are, are options, but obviously they have their sights set on, on Ukraine. The relationship between Russia and Belarus and the other nations that you mentioned is, is a bit different. Um, you, the, the, the Ukrainians know this. They know that they have been in uh, jeopardy of having this happen um, for many years now. And uh, as a result, they have been trying to beef up their assets to the, 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 you know, the, the amount that they could, the level that they can. But obviously that's not going to be on par with where Russia is at. Now, the 70% statistic is, is interesting. How do they calculate 70%? We don't know. But what the United States has reported on is that they have 70% capability. There are 83 battalions with about seven, 750 troops each. You can do the math. There's about 100,000 troops um, already aligned uh, and ready to go uh, on the border. Russia first denied this. Now they are not denying uh, this. And um, they're not there for anything other than, than to put this pressure on, on the Ukraine and to be ready to, to go right in. Uh, so yes, if it it happens, it would be what the, the White House is reporting, um, approximately 50,000 deaths and 5 million refugees on the run. Again, I don't know how they calculate these numbers. It could be more, it could be less. But the, the bottom line is that it, it will be a, a global catastrophe if this does happen, if, he, if Putin does not decide to back down. Uh, and um, we'll see. We'll see how the United States, you know, kind of responds to this. And uh, I know that the Europeans are up in arms. They don't want this to happen. They don't know how to react. And we haven't had a, a, a something like this happen in a long time. I mean, we're living in 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 a, in a post World War, um, you know, in, environment. So we have seen, you know, cyber attacks, and we have seen, you know, proxy attacks by by terrorist organization. But we haven't seen a nation try to invade another nation. And um, and for that reason, this is something to kind of sit back and watch. In in some ways, 
you know, ha handling it delicately. Um, but we will see. We'll see how Putin han handles this. Now, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says Beijing will end up owning some of the costs of a potential Russian invasion of Ukraine. Can you explain? Yeah, well... They're right about one thing, because when when you think that the White House is sleeping on things, well, it turns out that they're not. They, you know, what we we have talked about for a very long time, we've reported on this um, extensively at the Foreign Desk, is the relationship between Russia and China, and allowing this relationship to grow and allowing this partnership to grow. We also talk about the relationship between China and Iran, and China and now the Taliban in Afghanistan. We also talk about other nefarious you know relationships that are going on uh, around the globe, like Iran and Venezuela, right? Um, China taking over the African continent with its infrastructures and, and, and uh, telecommunications uh, projects. The issue is that while we are sleeping, China is taking over the world and they are inserting themselves and getting involved in, in, in situations that weaken the United States' positioning because that's exactly what they want to do. China doesn't want to become a world power. They are a world power. They want to become the world power. And for that reason, they are very excited about the prospect of Russia, you know, um, putting you know, the United States on, on alert right here and, and going against what the United States and the Western allies want. They would love for that to happen. And for that reason, Jake Sullivan is calling out the Chinese and saying you'd have equal blame in this because of the way that, that they have uh, this close relationship uh, with Russia and are really pro provoking a lot of the global tensions that we see right now. French President Emmanuel Macron flew to Moscow today seeking commitments from Russian President Vladimir Putin to dial down the tensions with Ukraine. But Lisa, let me ask you, will it really make any difference? Who knows? I mean, this looks like it's it's really symbolic in nature and nothing more. Macron did speak to Joe Biden before he went on his trip. Um, now, who's a weaker leader, Macron or Biden? I don't know who would be perceived as a weaker leader. Now, it looks like it is, is pretty, pretty... Um, uh, you know, just symbolic, just a photo op. I went over there. I tried to, you know, lay the law down. Uh, you know, Macron also has issues back at home. He's up, you know, for re-election. Uh, he wants to look like the big bad guy um, who's going out and, and fighting for, for you know, freedom and 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 fighting for sovereignty. Um, now, will it really work? I don't think a, a strong statesman like Putin is going to be afraid of a croissant-eating French guy like Macron. That's just if you ask me in in in, uh, in, in the one sentence. Um, but we shall see. I mean, it's, it's an interesting development, to say the least, to see him pick up and speak to, to Joe Biden and then go over and try to um, you know assuage things by himself. We shall see. We wish him luck. Lisa, there are reports that Iranian society is in a state of explosion because of crippling sanctions imposed on the country due to its illicit nuclear program. Social discontent has allegedly risen by 300% in the past year alone. Yeah, and again, I don't know where these numbers come from. I would say it's it's been it's been very high. Uh, if you speak to Iranians day to day, uh, the sanctions, and not only the sanctions. Now remember, Hal, when you want to paint the United States to be the big bad boogie guy, then you're gonna you're going to blame everything on the United States. So if they do get pharmaceuticals into the country because there are sanctions in place already, they will triple the price by themselves, or they will create a shortage in order to say, well, it's the United States' its fault. Especially because right now you have Iranians who have now. Uh, are becoming more aware of the fact that it's not anyone else's fault by the, but, but their own government. So to rally people back around the flag, to bring them in, to create this um, you know, unified enemy outside of their own, uh, they want to blame everything on the sanctions and blame everything on the United States. Now, don't get me wrong. The sanctions are obviously affecting uh, the economy there. They're affecting shortages uh, and things like that. But the government is absolutely creating um you know uh, the, the fake shortages and really inflating things to a place where they again can take advantage of the situation as they always have but under donald trump's presidency a lot of these sanctions that were placed were extremely targeted meaning that they were um targeting sectors that would solely or attempt to solely target the regime and the um, cyber capabilities, the nuclear capabilities, uh, and any weapons or, or military apparatuses. So because of that, um, we tried to attempt to not affect the people in, in the main street, street, street economy as much. But again, it all trickles down. Yes, it, it, they are being affected. 
But uh, the, the biggest Achilles heel for this government is the people and their disenchantment. And that's exactly why they would be afraid um, of having people come out onto the streets to protest. That's exactly what happened um, 43 years ago. And today is actually the anniversary of the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran. There was the revolution that happened that tossed the Shah of Iran out of his throne and brought in the Khomeini, Ayatollah Khomeini on this day, February 7th. Um, so, you know, you have, you, you have a lot of history and you have a lot of, of discontent. Uh, you have mothers and fathers who tell their children about the, the glory days in the 70s and, and what happened to their country. So, you know, the regime really wants to paint a bad picture of the United States, of the sanctions, and to bring people back to them and to support the government and to uh, keep them off the streets. Our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, thanks so much for your time today. My pleasure.